So a little bit about me. I teach at Access Creative College. I teach a games art and games tech and development courses there, um, mainly to 16 to 19 year olds. Um, for my sins, <laughs> but I really enjoyed teaching them. Um, we were previously access to music, some people might have heard of that, but we now offer um, courses in games and media and events now, so we're a much bigger family. Um, I also help co-organize Norfolk Game Developers. We're a community group of game developers based in Norfolk. Um, we meet up monthly, but there is no prerequisite for coming along. We actually welcome people who aren't developers to come along and chat with us, because it makes more interesting conversations. We were lucky enough to have some people from um, Norfolk County Council come along to our meetup, which was great. Um, and having those conversations is wonderful. So we are based on meetup. Please have a look at us if you'd like to come along. Um, and I'm on Twitter. Please feel free to aim any questions about the games industry um, to me, I'll try and attempt to answer them, um, or just point you to someone who knows more. So, misconception number one, I thought I'd go for a small one at the start. Um, film industry is bigger than the games industry. Um, that tends to be bandied around a lot. It's not quite true anymore, and it hasn't been since 2009. So in the UK, um, the video industry um, was overtaken by games. Um, that's Wii Sports, anyone play Wii? Um, just to the, set the scene of 2009, because when I, I saw it, I was like, that's not that long ago. This is what mobile phones looked like in 2009. Uh, we've moved on a little way from that, like the download speed. Um, so in 2019, the games industry has actually overtaken the music industry and film um, in the UK. This comment at the bottom was just there on the article when I was looking up the latest stats, and I thought it kind of represented some of the misconceptions that people have about game players and uh, game makers, so I, I thought I'd keep it in. I obviously disagree with it. Um, so the stats from UKI, which is the UK Independent Entertainment um, Association, are that music is looking at 1.3, video is coming in at 2.3 billion, and then games is 4.5. Um, a caveat of that is that the games industry revenue is measured around all elements of games. So we include things like um, merchandise, events, digital and physical sales. We do um, consoles, hardware, PCs. It, it's quite a broad spectrum that we use for measuring the value of the industry. So if I compared that with perhaps the BFI stats, that's usually the first thing that comes into the conversation. Um, but yes, we are quite large in the UK. Um, we are ranked number six in the world in terms of indus games industry size. So number of players, number of people making games, games being downloaded, money being spent on them, we're number six in the world. Um, we're not that far. And three, or oh, sorry, 37.3 million players in the UK this year. So we're quite a large family. Um, and like I said, money is being spent. 66% of players have spent money um, in-game. So when I say in-game, this is not taking into account them having purchased the game at the start. This is after they bought the original product, actually putting money into it. So that could be additional content, that could be a subscription service, but that's extra money that's being spent there. Um, just as a illustration of that, um, New Zoo are a great organization that capture all of this data. This is the global games market. We've had a lot of chat about mobile technology and how everyone's using their mobile phones for everything. That also counts for games. Um, mobile games make up the largest kind of portion on their own. Um, I'm sure many people in here, hands up, who has played Candy Crush, even though now it's quite old. Yeah, quite a few people in the room. Um, those of you that played Candy Crush, how many of you hadn't previously really considered yourselves a gamer? Yeah, a couple, yeah. Um, I myself prefer solitaire. So misconception number two is games are just for kids. Um, that happens a lot. Games can be for kids as much as anything else. Um, but some of the latest research shows that a lot of game players, the average player is about 35. Um, games have obviously grown up with a generation um, people that have played on the Commodore 64, um, right through to PlayStation 1, which for me was my first console. Um, but people are playing games in different ways. They're using them to fill time, they're using them as a tool to learn, um, they are using them 
as a social tool as well to meet people. Um, Tinder itself is really very gamified. So games are kind of featuring in all adult aspects of life just as much as children. Misconception number three, games are the work of the devil. Um, satanic panic hits the games industry a lot. Uh, this year it's been kind of put alongside many other horrible things that have gone on. Um, some of you may or may not have heard of Fortnite. Um, not two weeks, it's a game that took the UK by storm as well as the, uh, the rest of the world. And lots of um, headings came out like this. Um, and this. <laughs> um, I think games are like any other media. Too much of it, and it's not going to be a good thing. Um, using a bit of common sense there. But violence, which is obviously put in here, violent Fortnite. I mean, it, there's not blood in it, but it is violence, I guess. It's nothing new. Violence has existed as entertainment within society for a long time. Um, an argument could be made that the slaughtering of innocents virtually is, is better than the reality. Um, but we use this a lot when we're doing the debate at college. You know, uh, do video games cause violence? Well, violence has always been there. So how we're consuming it and interacting with it as a community is what has changed. So this is Take Pause. I wanted to pop this in here after I was talking about the violence of the Colosseum, um, just to talk about how games are being used also as a um, therapeutic aspect. So it's being made in collaboration with um, specialists in their field of psychology, looking into anxiety, and it's specifically aimed at teenagers because their mobile phones, much like Headspace, are what they are using the most to try and calm down if they're in an anxious environment. Um, and so there's a lot of research going into that as well. So we are turning the tide. Misconception number four. So uh, girls are, um, sorry, games are a boys thing. Uh, girls don't play games slash insert gender stereotypes. Um, funny enough, I play games. Um, I call it research, though, because obviously I teach games, so I can, I can pass that off now. Um, but the current stats on Yuki's site are 48% to 52% players, so we're actually very even in terms of game players. I'd say we've still got quite a way to go in terms of developers, but it is a pretty even split. Um, the types of games that different genders play is being looked into a lot. Um, and how they play, and like you saw with the kind of customer personas, very different ways of playing. But we are there. So the kind of breakdown of age brackets as well, it's spread fairly evenly across both genders um, in the UK, and how people are playing and where they're playing. Obviously, mobile games is the most common. Misconception number five, my final misconception. Um, games are entertainment only, not for cultural or serious uses. So I absolutely love when um, companies bring out free software, particularly because it means my students can use it. But um, this is Hannah. Hannah developed a game in 2011 um, which was about saving the environment, something that young people were really passionate about. Um, and she made it using um, a tool called Kodu which was teaching children how to code. Um, some of you may have heard of Scratch. That's being used in schools now as a way to encourage children to get involved in programming. But um, it was just interesting that when a child was given the opportunity to make a video game, they made it about saving the environment. I thought that was really telling. Um, she's now making games still. Another application, um, so Betty Adamu spoke at an event last week um, that I was also at. Um, called Hot Sauce, and she uses games through a market research perspective. So it's the same um, psychology and um, data measurement that you might find in a survey, but she puts all of that information into um, video games because they're more engaging. You get more engagement from the audience, people are more likely to actually tell you more about what they're doing. Um, and games can cover the four psychological needs, so relatedness, autonomy, mastery, and purpose things that a lot of people find in business as well when they run their own. That Dragon Cancer is a very special game. This game was created by a family that went through um, a very traumatic experience of one of the children having brain cancer, um, and it was terminal. And they actually used making a game as a family, so mum and dad and got the children involved, 
as a way to get through that experience, telling their story, um, adding human elements to it. And it's um, narrative focused. There's not a lot of kind of action in it, but it tells this amazing story and it puts you in someone else's shoes like um, I believe nothing else can. Um, this is Coming Out Simulator. Um, it's made by Nikki Case. This is just a little dialogue game where you're basically choosing dialogue options um, with friends and family um, and your other half at the time. And it was made for a game jam. It was just someone um, deciding that they were going to make something over a couple of days to try and tell the story of them coming out to their family. And there again, because you're the one making the decisions about what is said, you are in their shoes in that moment and you are having to um, weigh up those dilemmas. And it's now being used as a really helpful tool for other people to get the confidence to come out to their families, which I think is really positive. Um, this is Hair Na by Momopixel. Um, they're again very quickly made as a way to express herself when um, she constantly found people trying to touch her hair. Um, I think it's very clear the message that is being made by this game. Um, and I just love that um, video games are able to give people that voice. Um, and it's not just around the world. We have amazing games being made in Norfolk. So um, Lyalark was made by a group of Norwich University of the Arts graduates. Um, and, oh sorry, Lyalark is the games company. Rhythm of the Gods is the game. And Small Talk about games, about Small Talk is by Hannah Rose. Um, she struggles with making small talk with people, so made a game where she was kind of encountering that kind of awkward conversations with people about the weather or what's going on um, as a way to express herself. And it's not just people that have studied games development that can make games now. All of these pieces of software are freely available. Some of them run in browser, so even if you don't have a computer at home, you can access them through a library or somewhere else. And it's really something that I hope everyone can gain something from. If you have a story to tell, please consider games as part of it. And also, consider talking to a game developer near you. All right, thank you very much.